The last time you and I caught up, you were a little bit more bearish. I think I walked away with a view that you were a little bit more bearish. You, you mentioned $45. We didn't quite get there. As you look at the market today, how bullish or bearish are you? Well, obviously, in classical trader style, that was, that was a mistake. That was wrong. Um, I think the markets have done remarkably well in terms of the, 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 the run-up has been, I think, much stronger than we or most of the industry thought in oil. I'm talking, obviously, strictly oil. Um, lots of factors, lots of reasons, which obviously we can talk about. Weak dollar, you know, good performance from OPEC, not fantastic performance yet from U.S. crude, all sorts of things. But, yeah, no, I'm, I, I think we're, obviously, we're having a bit of a pullback right now, but... You know, overall, I think we're slightly more bullish. Slightly more bullish. I mean, one of the notes that I read at the end of last week was Goldman Sachs talking about $82.50. I broke the shell numbers and they talked about we're making as much money as we did when we were at $100. How far can the run go? What's the main driver of the run? Hey, that's a good question because I think actually there are lots of different drivers, which I think is, makes it more difficult to really isolate one particular factor. As I said, I think the whole macro environment is, is a, a bit of a reasoning behind the backdrop. You know, as I said, we have had a weak dollar, um, and that's, I think, and obviously there's a big pull down in stocks on, on the end of last week, and they've obviously dampened sentiment. Um, for us, we always look at the oil fundamentals, and that's the big thing for us. They are absolutely fine. Um, you know, perhaps the oil production that we expected from the U.S. is a bit later coming than we anticipated, but it's, we think it's still going to come. Um, perhaps demand in China is not, not as quite as rampant as we thought, but it's going to come. So, in general, for oil, we are very solid. But do I see Goldman Sachs' numbers? No. They have to sell something, don't they? They have to sell something, but we'll come back to the price in a moment. How physically tight is the market, given what you've just said? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's tight, but not... I mean, we're going into turnarounds now in the U.S., so we're, we're getting a little bit more slack in the system, which we'd expect at this time of year. Um, so um, it was very tight. You know, it has been cold, again, particularly in Northern Europe and the U.S. You know, really has been really pretty cold. Um, but we're just beginning to get into a phase which will last for about six weeks where it's not quite as tight. We've also, we're also in that maintenance period. Do you think the maintenance period this year is going to be as tight as last year? Um, difficult to say. I mean, the, you know, maintenance periods are, you know, they're always a little bit different. You're absolutely right. Each one is slightly different. I mean, for example, this year, the, the, the maintenance in the U.S. is very much dictated by the heavy sour refineries are going down, which, which is a crude area which isn't that tight. So what we do expect, of course, is the actual stock draws in Cushing, which obviously tend to be the, the highlighted number every week, will continue to actually go down. So Cushing will continue to draw. The demand side, you touched on it there, China perhaps not just as voracious a demand as perhaps the market had expected. One of the things that comes to mind when I talk about China is skipping a generation in terms of demand. One of the big topics is, of course, about electric car production. How is that potentially going to affect demand? And is it affecting demand at the moment? You know, I, I think it's really at the margin, man. It's really quite small. Um, you know, we're not seeing... I mean, we are seeing a bit of a spike in, in Asian EVs, but it's really very, very small in terms of the whole, you know, the whole total fleet numbers. So, yes, there's a bit more interest. Yes, the Chinese are doing a lot of work in the area, but no, is it going to be significant? I don't think so. The US output, we've touched on this. I mean, they're now at 10 million barrels a day for the first time in more than four decades. Is that what puts a cap on the market price, the U.S. production? I think that's right. I think ultimately, well, the U.S. production, which then gets basically exported, I mean, I think that's the interesting thing, is where does the exports go to? Is there enough demand for the exports? We think there probably will be. But it's, it's the translation of that extra production into the exports and then the cap effectively on the market. And I think it's just making sure that the logistics are working, that everything can get effectively, you know, smoothly through from production to exports. I read a lovely line this morning. The U.S.'s Permian Basin is looking like Saudi Arabia, and this is the former reservoir management over at Saudi Aramco. Your estimate in terms of the size and the scale of shale? Yeah, yeah listen, it's very difficult um, to really put, put, a, put a number on it. I think one thing I would highlight, which I think is quite significant, is that 
lots of companies who are you know, working in, in the shale world have begun to show a lot more capital discipline than was previously the case or previously recognised. And I think they will continue to be really focused on creating cash flow, creating dividends. And I think there is going to be a little bit of cost inflation coming through as well. So I think all that means is that shale is unquestionably the potential for the next, you know, probably 10 years. But it will be done in quite a, I think, disciplined way. Do you think shale will go for value over volume, which is what they promised? Well, they suggested, they suggested it and then they didn't deliver it. And I think now the focus is on delivering it. So yes, it's the answer to that question. Now you said Goldman's are, are a bit bullish. They're selling eighty-two and a half dollars in three months, and they're selling a bit higher in six. So you're the man with the finger on the pulse. Where can we get in, in, in the three months to six months view? Uh, you know, listen, I wouldn't be surprised to see us do do both. You know, flirt with a sixty and flirt with a seventy. So I'm 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 pretty comfortable. Well, I mean, we're pretty comfortable in this type of range. But yeah, we'll, we'll see a bit of both. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised to see the market. You know edge into the tight, into the low 70s, but also I wouldn't be surprised at the end of this turnaround phase to see us drift back into the, you know, the mid-60s. Mid-60s. Tell me this, were you surprised by how well OPEC and non-OPEC came together and adhered to the agreement? Yeah, no, I, th I think we've been impressed. I think uh, uh, His Excellency the Minister in Saudi Arabia has done a fantastic job and they have, I think, been, been impressive, there's no other word for it. They've, they've not broken the line. Obviously, they've had a few outliers. The Iraqis have been a little bit uh, difficult to, you know, <laughs> corral. But in general, I think it's been very successful. Does it change after the Russian election? Um, many people say there's a symbiotic relationship between Putin, Novak, and Al Fali. They all needed one another. Does that change after what's presumed uh, a continuation of the Putin, uh, Putin administration? I don't think so. I think we're all expecting everybody to be almost the same people in place. I, you know, maybe there's one or two changes, but I don't think so. I think they do need each other and they're all, I think, working together, you know, to make sure that's um, a, a positive relationship. Um, the, the whole sort of media brawl over we need to know an exit strategy. Um, what do you make of that argument? Do you think that that's, yeah, you wanted that in the bond markets, but we don't need that necessarily here in the oil market yet. Yeah, I think that is a bit of a question mark, and I think the, the, the industry is not really focused on that at the moment, which is probably, because uh, I don't think there's a good answer to that question. Um, I think, you know, that the, the there will be mounting pressure at the end of this year, probably, to, to have an exit, and I don't really see that we've got a logical one yet. Do the Saudis need it to run tight through into 2019 so that they can get their IPO away? It, well, yes, assuming that the IPO is going to go, they, they definitely need it to be, well, tight, they need it to be, yeah, firm, not, um, no wobbles, please. No wobbles, please. Um, will, do you think the IPO will go? Do you think Saudi Aramco will IPO? Yeah, I think they probably will. Um, obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for them, um, selecting locations and, and everything else. But yes, I think they will. Now, you're a trader and maybe it's not your bread and butter, but would you take a stake in Saudi Aramco if, if that opportunity came along? Yeah, I think it's probably going to be, I think it's probably going to be good value and probably will be, um, will be an attractive thing over the longer term to have. Um, you know, we're still, fundamentally, we're still, you know, I know everybody regards oil as a bit of a dinosaur, but we're still fundamentally quite positive about our wonderful commodity. So, yes, I think so, yeah. Finally, on the market, what, what is the risk, as you say, we'll go to the end of the year, possibly with a bit of information in terms of an exit strategy. As you look at that bandwidth, 60 bids, 70 offered, What's the possibility of this OPEC, non-OPEC deal over-tightening the market? Yeah, I think obviously there is a, a small possibility that could happen. I think, but that does assume that demand is way up in the 1.8s, you know, maybe 1.9s for this year. Um, you know, it's very early days, well, very early days, but our initial read suggests that it probably isn't going to quite make that number. So I think... I think the chance of it really over tightening substantially isn't really a strong one at the moment. Let's talk about VTOL. Oh um, my God. You sure yeah, you want to do that? Business. We'll play a sport, okay? Uh, you, your first half profits were up by 50% last year. That was on asset sales. 2016, you made $2 billion, the third highest ever. What are we looking at for 2017? <laughs> now, you know I'm not going to give you a straight answer on this one. 
But um, listen, we've had a, a relatively solid year. Um, sadly, it won't be quite at the level of 2016, be a little bit less, um, a few less opportunities, maybe a few less asset sales. Um, but, you know, we continue to be relatively happy with the way the business is developing and growing, and, and that's what we want to do. So just below the two, just below the two billion dollars. We're quite sure about just below. It'll be, it'll be, it certainly will be below. We understand that you've hired banks to look into the IPOs of Vivo and Varo, and we never quite got to that question when I saw you had oil and money. So can you confirm that you've hired the banks for me first of all? <laughs> yes, I can. I can. How close to putting term sheets out are we on Vivo or Varo? What, what, what's your timeline? Well, these things, as you know, uh, we're not always in control of them and they, they do take a bit of time. I think the answer is we're pretty close. I think they're both going to happen and, and we're going to... Um, and obviously, uh, we have partners in both those firms and so and they're keen for, to make these things happen. So, yeah, they'll both happen. So the PE, are they, are they, are they a bit pushy at the moment? Do they, do they want an exit from you? Is that what's driving it? Um, um, you know, PE tends to want exits, obviously. Uh, that's what they're... That's what they're looking for. Um, and yes, they're, they're, therefore, they're the main drivers. One of the things that people talk to me about is the margin in your business, sort of peak oil 2030 is, is where people are talking about being peak oil, um, a little bit earlier than perhaps we all assumed. The margins in your business are getting harder. So I suppose what I want to know for VTOL and for, for you is the discussions you have about the future, VTOL going forward. What is it? Is it more LNG? Is it more lending? Is it perhaps a little bit less the core of what you built? I think, listen, I, 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 obviously, listen, it changes. And that's one of the beautiful things about our business. It's constantly in, in, in change. And supply and demand constantly changes. And the bits of supply and demand constantly change. So, yes, does it mean more LNG? For sure. Um, probably does it mean more LPG, more gasoline? For sure. Um, does it mean less fuel oil? Well, yes, probably, but I mean, you know, fuel oil, for example, that product is going to go a fundamental change with the IMO 2020 when the sulfur levels go down for, for fuel oil in, 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 the, in the bunkering world. So, you know, our, our business is really a logistically driven business, which is constantly changing. And that's where the opportunity lies. The size and the scale of BP, Shell and Total and their trading arms, how much is that nipping away at your traditional margin? Is, is that the biggest challenge in the core business? Yeah, no, I mean, they are, they all run fantastically efficient and, and, and very professional trading arms. And yes, I mean, it, it is constantly very, very competitive. So yes is the answer. Now, 2016, you traded 7 million barrels of oil per day. I think the magical number, my colleague Javier tells me, is 10 million barrels. How close are we to, 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 how close are we to, the, to the magic well, number I'm, of 10 million I'm sorry to disappoint him, but we're not going to get there in 2017. Um, and I'm not, quite sure, but I'm not quite sure we'll ever get there because that's a big number. And that's a massive increase in market share. And, you know, market share is now pretty hard fought by everybody in the business. So, you know, uh, I'm afraid I may have to disappoint him. But to get there or the ambition to get there do you still want to buy businesses or, or do you just want to grow organically? What, I mean, I know you're a deal maker by nature. So yeah, how, but how do you improve on the seven? I, mean, I think we should stress that, that you, know, you only want to improve on the seven if you think it can make you a bit more money. Yes. Return on capital is still the key, key element. And you know, when we look at things, um, that's what drives us. So we may actually end up doing perhaps less business if it could be at a better margin. That would be fine. So I think, you know, don't, don't assume that we're always just going to go for volume. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're interested in buying um, uh, more businesses. Um, we're, we're looking at quite a few right now, and I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, but that but is very naturally my next question. Of course. You, so so, of course. so let, let's have a go at that sport. So you're still in the business of buying. Absolutely. You're, you're still in the business. Absolutely. So help me here. Gas, oil, trading physical look just just help me a, a wee bit give me a curtain raiser for 20, 2018 well listen there's been a big change in the price of oil so you, you wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that we're looking quite closely at you know the upstream side again you know 
is the cash flows that can be produced by investing in the upstream of on oil and gas now sufficient to, to justify re-entering that space, which we, we weren't in particularly. So, I mean, that's a big question for the firm, and that's one that we're, we're looking at. I mean, we have a big, pro massive project down in Ghana, as you probably know, um, and, you know, that is going to be, you know, something that, that type of project is something we'll look at doing more of. Growth in the United States, let's just circle off a few issues. Um, the, the moniker that I was given is the king of gasoline in the United States of America. Um, it, does that continue to be a, an ambition to grow the U.S. gas side of the business? Yeah, no. I mean, sorry, I think you said, I, think you said, I mean, we, we did, the, as you probably know, this year we acquired the noble business. Yes. And that will take quite a bit of integration. Um, and uh, Going well? Yeah, going well, going well. But, you know, you, you do these things, you know, and there's, there's ridiculous headlines from wonderful people like yourselves. And then we have, we have to do the hard work of actually making it fit. Um, and it, that does take time. That takes time. The world wakens up this morning to a bit of volatility. There's a yeah. uh, generation of traders in equities and bonds that are probably quite startled, I, I, I would imagine. How do you look at the volatility at the moment, Ian? You walk in, you're walking around the world. Give me your view on, on market volatility at the moment. Listen, I, I, obviously, it is a bit more volatile. Um, I mean, for us, it's, a, it's bluntly a fact of life, and, 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 and we don't really worry about it too much because hopefully we're basically hedged. Um, which we are, I'm, pl I'm pleased to say. And, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I want to just stress that point that we're about the physical movement of oil and gas. And that's what we try and concentrate on. So, you know, we're still moving that cargo that was moving. That cargo that was moving on Friday is still moving today. So we just got to make sure that the hedges are in place and that nothing's gone awry, and, which I'm pleased to say it hasn't. So we just, you know, steady as she goes.